Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting in a minute. So, uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, meeting of the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. It's 9 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I see a, a few tired souls around the table uh, today. And um, I thank you for coming in early. We've got an interesting session today uh, that we'll be discussing. Uh, first, a quick rundown of what the Core Internet Values are, and then we'll dig into the, the meat uh, or the vegetables, depending on whether you are um, a vegetarian or not. But we'll dig into the food very uh, quickly, uh, speaking about the GDPR first, the General Data Protection Regulation, and how that breaks the uh, core internet values. And then uh, Article 11 of the European uh, Directive on E-Commerce. And uh, after that, we will have a uh, discussion on Article 13. Um, and then we'll have comments from uh, the community 
So we have the agenda that's currently online is the agenda that we'll be uh, pursuing. There is a reference document linked to the agenda uh, that has the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, position paper that was uh, written for this session and that explains the concerns uh, that will be expressed uh, during this session. Uh, we are supposed to have uh, possibly a remote participant, but I'm looking at the speaking queue and it's empty, and I don't find them online, so I might have to cover for that person. But um, I uh, think that we can just get started and um, see if that person turns up. We might have to shuffle the agenda around a little bit. Uh, my name is Olivier crépin Blanc. I'm the chair of the Dynamic Coalition. I have been for a number of years and uh, it's just one of my hats. I'm also the chair of the European at-large organization in ICANN, which uh, provides input uh, into the ICANN policy processes from uh, internet end users, and also the chair of the uh, UK chapter of the Internet Society, so several uh, things. Um, we have distinguished guests with us today, um, including, and I'm going to, to uh, just get them to raise their hand, I guess. Um, we, um, so Alejandro Pesanti is supposed to um, follow us remotely from Mexico. It is the middle of the night over there, so uh, we, we'll see. Uh, we have Desiree Milosevic, um, who's sitting next to me. Um, Desiree, in a, in a few words, what are your responsibilities? What, 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 what do you do? Uh, thank you, Olivier. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a team lead member of the Internet Society UK chapter. I think that's uh, what I've been listed as. Um, but I also um, have other um, uh, heads that I wear, sometimes as a chair of the SHARE Foundation in Serbia and also um, um, a board trustee of the Internet Society. But I'll be speaking in my capacity of the uh, ISOC UK chapter. Thank you, Desiree. And next to you is Diego Naranjo. Yeah, um, I'm Senior Policy Advisor for uh, European Digital Rights, which is a network of 39 NGOs uh, working on human rights in the online environment. And I work on data protection, privacy, and also copyright. Thank you, Diego. And on the other side of the table, uh, we have Andrew Sullivan. Hi, I'm Andrew Sullivan. I'm the President and CEO of the Internet Society. Uh, I'm sorry I'm on this side, but that's because I may have to duck out at some point, and so I thought I'd be closer to the door and less disruptive. Thank you very much, Andrew. So um, these are our three uh, main speakers in the room, and we'll start immediately with a brief background on the core internet values. Do we have, I'm turning over to remote particip participation, do we have any pulse from Emilia and Shei Chong. Okay, so welcome to our uh, remote participants, but uh, we don't have Alejandro, so I will cover for him uh, in the meantime. The, the uh, first part uh, is just a brief rundown of what the core internet values are. And uh, these are really technical values, um, not uh, societal values as such, but these are technical values on which uh, the internet was built on. So uh, values such as them being, uh, uh, the internet being based on packet switching, having a layered architecture, um, having uh, this interoperability for all of the uh, different devices being on there um, and for the, the different networks to be able to uh, work with each other. It is an internet after all. Um, it also has uh, a number of uh, important values such as openness. Um, the end-to-end -end, uh, principle is also very important. It's very decentralized um, and it has to be uh, robust. And it's, of course, scalable as uh, it started out as a very small network and grew uh, very fast to what it is today. Um, the values themselves have been uh, defined in prior year uh, papers that we have published. They are uh, available on the IGF website. Um, so they are uh, given there in more detail. Um, I'm not sure it's a great use of our time given the only one hour that we have here to dig deep into them. But really, one of the concerns that we have is, uh, as a coalition is that there are a number of developments out there uh, every year uh, that uh, break core internet values and uh, might make the network very different to what it was originally intended to be. Uh, and we're looking at here uh, at uh, some of the points which may stifle innovation or, or uh, if the uh, network, uh, for example, openness, if the openness is not uh, there anymore, then you might start having uh, barriers to uh, 
uh, to new entrants, and uh, especially when it comes down to all of the services that you find out there. So the internet is a very particular uh, animal, as one would say, in that it does allow pretty much any startup to come up with an idea and put it out there, and there's no requirement for licensing and so on. And in the, um, I guess that in the speech that we heard a couple of uh, days ago from uh, President Macron, um, certainly several instances of regulation uh, were mentioned, and so there certainly uh, would be concerns, and we might be looking at this next year as to what type of regulation uh, might uh, infringe on core internet values. Today, we're looking at the uh, General Data Protection Regulation as one of the <coughs> sorry, recent, uh, recent um, things that have happened um, that uh, has certainly changed uh, a little bit some of the values, and then Article 11 uh, and Article 13, which we'll dig into more detail uh, afterwards. So when it comes down to the, um, the paper that we have here, um, I guess that the, the uh, as far as the GD GDPR is concerned, um, you certainly have uh, a regulation which is intending to protect privacy uh, in specific form of personal data protection, uh, but that forces internet operators intermediary and intermediaries to establish rules for packet traffic based on geographical boundaries, which are not well defined uh, on the internet itself. Um, so it's uh, not well represented by this whole uh, thing of IP addresses and no borders uh, between uh, the networks. Uh, the concept of national IP addressing, uh, so these are the, the numbers basically that every single computer connected on the internet requires to be able to operate. The concept of having national um, uh, IP addresses is uh, something which completely changes the way the internet is defined. Um, the EU copyright directive establishes obligations for internet operators uh, that can only be complied with by breaking the layered architectures um, derived obligation of avoiding cross-layer uh, operations. The transit of packets between certain pairs of points has to be interrupted to inter uh, intercept them and inspect their contents in the higher layers, then make a human or human proxy through some automated algorithmic decision process, um, a decision on whether to let the packets arrive at their destination or else to start a notification process to parties such as the sender, the destination, the operator, the intermediaries and the um, authorities. And some countries are establishing and putting operation uh, surveillance systems that violate the end-to-end -end principle as well and force layer crossings in order to uh, affect the openness and decentralization process. So these types of systems also affect the scalability of, uh, of the network. The moment you introduce um, more equipment between the start and the end, um, you certainly um, have a problem when it comes down to the volume of information that comes through. So we're generally concerned that the layered architecture is not well understood globally, and when um, one speaks of regulation uh, in many instances, um, one then very quickly gets concerned listening to these uh, calls for regulation as um, not really well defining what layer to be regulated. Um, the layer is the, the uh, internet uh, layered architecture starting with a basic layer being the physical layer, and the uh, telecommunication uh, side of things. And of course, that is already regulated. Um, but most of the time, uh, in fact, 99% of the time, uh, one is really looking at one of the really highest layers, which is the content. Um, and that is not very well defined or even understood uh, outside the uh, technical community uh, that, that put the internet together. In the past, we looked at uh, freedom from harm in our recent discussions, uh, that was last year's discussions. I invite you to uh, have a look at the uh, video from that, uh, from that session. Uh, but better definitions of harm have been forthcoming and actions have been started in different fora, such as standards and architectures that endorse, uh, enclose IoT devices, Internet of Things, in distributed but not flat architectures or laws demanding higher levels of security for devices. And, uh, more recently, the uh, British government has uh, come up with a, uh, a paper uh, that uh, provides some guidelines as to, um, or some best practice uh, as to how to uh, have uh, uh, security by design in, uh, in IoT. Again, here we're looking at many different layers from the actual device itself uh, to the actual services that run on the, on the device. I'm not quite sure if I've covered GDPR well enough, but I, I could turn over to Desiree Milosevic um, if 
I could ask you to, to add a, little, a few more words on the, uh, how GDPR uh, infringes on some of the core values, if uh, you're okay with this, Desiree. Well, thank you, Olivier. I believe I'll, I'll briefly uh, res respond to that of um, what I also think um, about GDPR and whether or not it infringes of any of the um, core internet values um, and the issues that I've seen. So I think that there are three main, um, main things and that is that uh, GDPR, uh, GDPR regulation reinforces user-centric right. Um, that means that the internet users in should be in control of their data and, um, and therefore it actually doesn't break that right it, it reinforces it and the ability of an end user to control information that is held about them um, i also think that uh, gdpr is um, the regulations is finally on the side of internet users and i think this is uh, great news we we don't have many regulations where we actually are uh, thinking how internet users are protected and that is uh, uh, I think a core value also of, of this regulation so congratulations to the uh, European uh, Commission and the Parliament for uh, adopting this regulation in that sense and reinforcing the internet users rights um, and uh, it is also the highest standard of protection so ideally uh, it also causes some of the frictions that we have seen and that is the fact that the GDPR has this extraterritorial nature whereabout uh, it obliges other countries to follow the regulation of protecting EU citizens. Uh, so um, whilst uh, this is um, a, a good thing that our, uh, that our internet rights are protected and that we have control about the information that we can delete information one of the novel things for GDPR is actually that is this right is also in a machine readable form um, that means that you can take your information from let's say a social platform that you use um, not to mention names and take it to another social platform in this machine readable format. So that gives this additional um, user centric core. But to go back of, um, about expectations, implications and the difficulties of extraterritoriality uh, that it imposes. Uh, the question is um, that um, uh, many citizens and, and netizens would like this uh, data portability, but if so many other countries are about to come up with the regulation um, that they would impose an extraterritorial basis, it would be really a, a nightmare to comply and regulate with this information. So um, that is um, one of the things that is um, proving difficult with this. So no credits for that, but um, uh, credits for higher standard of um, uh, protection and higher standards of regulation that we're hopeful that countries that do not have privacy laws would therefore try to synchronize and, and adopt some similar <coughs> privacy laws and this is definitely happening in Serbia because uh, it's one of the countries that is wishing to join EU so they have already adopted a similar law that would um, protect internet control of users uh, of what information other platforms and companies uh, hold about them um, and have on the record. But um, lastly, to finish just a comment on the GDPR so that we can all get into nitty gritty discussion about other things, I think uh, it's fair to say uh, about the um, maybe false expectations of how this regulation is being um, implemented. Um, users, uh, for example, are European users, when they go to some of the non-EU websites, are asked additional information. So you have to give consent again, and you have to um, uh, again, give more permission in terms of term, terms or services, for example, and therefore it's uh, questionable how much extra permission you're now giving to those, um, let's say, websites that as a user you visit because you currently have to um, opt in into many other um, regulations or terms and services of that player. And um, it has definitely been a, a costly exercise, but it's uh, also good to say that although it's proportionate, if you are an um, industry player that has a lot of data um, about internet users, 
you, pro you, you proportionally have to take measures to guard, safeguard and protect that data and, and not sell it and pass it on. Um, but if you only hold a small amount of uh, users' data on your platform, obviously you would um, do uh, less work in um, or proportionate amount of work. So, for example, Chicago Tribune, uh, the newspapers, has um, decided not to serve European Internet users with their, um, uh, with their content because maybe they have um, done a calculation that it is... Uh, <laughs> that for them it's probably um, either more economical or, or they will pay less fines in, in case that um, they are not breaching any of the GDPR rules. So, so we're seeing these chilling effects, if you like, <laughs> of um, um, Internet users in Europe not being able to access all the content um, outside of EU. I can invite others to also comment on GDPR if we want to continue on that topic and then go back to uh, link tax. Yeah, thank you for this, Desiree. Um, I'm a little concerned about the time, so what I was going to suggest is that we have the whole discussion, all the topics at the end uh, by opening the floor. Otherwise, we'll, we might end up running out of time for the presentations that we have today. But thank you for your um, contribution on this and for showing that it's not only negative, I guess. We've got a bit of everything. And that's one of the points, actually, with regards to uh, the development. Some, some developments actually do reinforce some core values and we often are too uh, intent on seeing what doesn't work or the threats but not enough recon uh, recognizing not enough the things that actually are going in the right direction. So I guess I can uh, give you the floor again now then to uh, move on to uh, Article 11 and uh, with a brief background of what this is. Uh, th thank you, yes. I'll continue with the um, Ar Article 11, which is a part of the EU um, copyright reform. Its specific article is also known as uh, link tax, and um, that article, the Parliament will now, the EU Parliament would enter in a final negotiations with the Council, and, and uh, it will be drafted and finalized in January 2019. However, uh, each of the European countries will, may have different implementation of this uh, new EU copyright reform. It's part of the 2016 uh, copyright directive. So what is um, actually um, particularly interesting about this Article 11 when we talk about um, core internet values, um, uh, firstly, what it is about is that the news aggregators like, let's say, Google News will have to pay a small publishers a fee for including the link um, to the article they have might published on their platform. Um, but as we know, the devil is in the, is in the detail, so um, um, the um, fact is that although it only refers to companies uh, who may wish to reuse the articles that are published um, by some uh, publishers, it's not quite precise how many additional words in addition to the URL itself. And you know that URL is something like the long string of HTTP, www, bbc.co.uk, let's say Macron dash will not regulate the internet dot HTML and so on. Uh, so it's, um, uh, it's really um, interesting that uh, you cannot uh, copyright this URL, but then the link tag says that you can use few additional words. And if we uh, look at the regulation in Germany, sp specifically on this link tax, it has been uh, very little evidence um, that it has been possible to actually get any money uh, from any news aggregators based on the current state of law in Germany. It's been very difficult to answer um, to any questions from the especially Green Party since 2014. Uh, what does constitute uh, really these two additional words that you can include to describe the link uh, that you're copying? So I think that's um, probably um, uh, um, one of the, the main issue is that these rights are uh, assigned on a geographical basis. So the, uh, the links uh, that could be um, copyrighted with a few additional words only refer to the publishers um, and in the European Union. And that has to be respected by uh, the news aggregators um, across um, the world. Um, the other um, probably worth uh, mentioning point uh, uh, when it comes to Article 11 is that uh, 
users are uh, exempted from this regulation, so individuals would be able to um, copy those links, um, so it only refers to companies. However, uh, it will negatively also affect the content that is generated by the Internet users, and we know that. Uh, we are all participants and user content generated at the same time. And I think it also um, clashes with the um, openness of the Internet, uh, one of the core Internet values, um, this link tax, um, because uh, we know that um, in, in order to link and get further information and get from one page to another, uh, this is how we learn to use the Internet, to share information, to reference, reference other resources and so on. So the, um, uh, the fact that um, we will not be able to actually get any internet <coughs> users, bloggers or journalists um, who are writing to get any um, similar uh, um, treatment is, is a problem and um, there's also a problem with decentralization because what we're going to see is that um, this concentration of data provision to content providers can actually afford the costs brought by the regulation break. <coughs> Um, and, and will break this decentralized value that we are working towards to have as many uh, different resources and many different, um, I think, uh, not concentrated and not centralized uh, ways of, of controlling and regulating um, the network. So I'll um, stop here and be happy to answer any questions when we go deeper into that discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, Desiree. Now we turn over to Diego Naranjo for Article 13, and I believe Diego has some slides. So if we could have the slides up, please. The, the slides? The slide deck, please. Sorry. Yeah, Fantastic. we can go to Thank the second you. one already. Thanks. To the, yeah. to the second slide, please. Can you go to the second slide? Yeah. Uh, don't worry about the slides. I, I'm always afraid when I see someone with slides that there will not be uh, many words. Um, uh, on Monday you heard a fable about the protection of authors and how important it is that, that we protect them and, and blah, blah, blah. I, I, I agree with the idea. I don't agree that, that the solution is to, uh, breaking the decentralized internet and, and filtering everything. Um, the COVID directive, as uh, the city was mentioning, was proposed in 2016. <coughs> Among uh, many other things about Article 11, this Article 13 uh, proposes uh, a change in the liability of platforms uh, in a way that uh, it will impact uh, the internet that, uh, that we know uh, to a great extent. The idea behind uh, Article 13 is quite simple. Um, authors or those uh, big multinationals uh, and that say they represent authors and also collecting societies and they say that they don't get enough money from some big platforms such as YouTube and others and because they don't have a leverage of negotiation with them they do get some money from them they don't get enough apparently uh, that's probably true I, I, I may agree with them uh, but what they propose what the European Commission proposed and what they are uh, what these stakeholders are, are supporting is uh, a sort of a preemptive censorship. What they propose that the, these platforms are going to be now directly liable. So uh, instead of uh, the current system, the e-commerce directive, uh, where these companies need to be notified of some illegal uh, action uh, being, uh, being done, exercised through their servers, and then taking the content down, that they can monetize uh, the content or any other uh, similar uh, action based on notice and, and action procedures they will need to preemptively uh, prevent the availability. That's what the text from the Commission said. That's what the, the Council is proposing as well. And, um, and this has been launched with a, with a lot of uh, cheerful uh, uh, comments, like uh, we are going to protect authors, they are starving, and we need to do something, which is true. But uh, um, if we do this change, we, we change the liability of the platforms, what's going to happen, they're going to be trying to avoid to being sued. They're going to try to uh, avoid any problems with the rights holders, and by default, they, they're going to overblock more of the content. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, that's one of the, the first of the problems that I see with, uh, with algorithms uh, regulating uh, free speech on the Internet, is that they don't work. Um, uh, there's a rich literature as the impact assessment of the 
recently uh, launched uh, terrorist content regulation uh, is saying that, that there's rich literature saying that uh, these filters won't work. Uh, one example that I can mention is that James Rose, uh, the famous pianist, was trying to upload a video of himself playing a piece of Bach that he was playing in his living room. Uh, he uploaded that to YouTube. Uh, somehow uh, the, the algorithm recognized that that was a, a piece uh, owned by Sony Music. Um, Bach died a few uh, centuries ago, and of course that uh, piece is outside of copyright. But anyway, that content was taken down, then he had to fight to get his own video of himself playing back in the living room back online. And, and as that, there are many other examples, and we feel that the, this could be uh, the next phase of using the internet to regulate free speech, because uh, although we have uh, currently a, a good system of checks and balance in the European Union, we see uh, some threats in some member states, uh, namely Hungary, Poland, but uh, now also Italy and others that could go in the wrong direction. Uh, we fear that they can uh, start saying uh, some sort of DMCA request saying, okay, this content is against copyright, so please take it down. The other problem is that the algorithms do not recognize uh, things like uh, parodies like this one. This is actually a, a real image. I just put the, uh, the, the speech bubble. Uh, but it's a real image from Build. And are they going to recognize parodies? Are they going to be able to allow memes or any other uh, source of free speech? How is that going to work in practice? How are we going to have a proper redress mechanism? And that's the next slide, please. Um, what's going to happen in the end is that, uh, as we see with the content ID on YouTube and in, in many other uh, uh, platforms that use similar mechanisms, in the end, what's going to happen is that when you go to any of these platforms and say, hey, I have this legal content that's been taken down illegally, based, I have a right to, to parody because I live in the UK and that's exception, blah, 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 that's very nice. They won't go to, to talk to their lawyers to ask if that's true or not. They're going to say, yeah, that's very nice. I'm sorry, this is against our terms of service. Then good night and go away. That's what's going to happen. That's why the redress mechanism will not work. The other reason is that, um, um, although nice for data protection geeks uh, like myself, they, they say in their copyright directive that they will not collect personal data of the users. So how, if, uh, if I go to YouTube and I ask them to take some content back because it's mine and I think it's legal, how, what are they going to say? They're going to say, well, you, I don't know if you uploaded that content or not. I don't have any data about you. Why should I uh, respond to that request? Again, terms of service, bye-bye, have, have a good day. So that's probably the, what's going to happen. Next slide, please. I'm reaching almost the end. So three, uh, these are the three main elements. The, the copyright directive in its Article 13 in all of, the, um, all of the versions from the Commission, from the Council, and implicitly in the uh, one that proposed by the European Parliament, are bringing upload filters that will not work, that will block uh, legal content, and then bring a useless redress mechanism that will not uh, help users. Um, the good news is that uh, while we are here in, the, in, in Paris, uh, although we heard some, the speech I was mentioning before on Monday, this is also the city of the Commune de Paris. Uh, so I think there's uh, time for, for a sort of a revolt. Uh, we have time until February. Uh, we will be active on saveyourinternet.eu uh, trying to bring uh, this, uh, this measure down. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this, Diego, and thank you for this call to arms. Um, it is something, Paris is, is known for this sort of thing, so um, great, great to hear this. Now let's move on over to Andrew Sullivan for comments from Andrew Sullivan. Uh, yes, so I am Andrew Sullivan, and as usual, I try not to speak for other people. Uh, but I, I think that there's an important um, uh, theme that's running through uh, the discussion that we're hearing here, and it's, it's really this. If you have a core value, and remember, these core values are not, they're, they're not political values, right? What we're not saying is, oh, this is the way the world should be. What, what the core values say is, if you want internet, this is what you're buying into. You don't have any choice about this. Interoperation is a necessary condition for having an internet. Um, if you want an internet, then you have to have more than one network. You can't internet on your own. So, so the, the key thing about this is that you have to have this interoperation. 
And in order to have interoperation, it seems to me, you have to have operation at all. The fundamental problem with most of these mechanisms is that they're not actually intended to allow the network to work. They're an, in, they're an attempt to fix a social problem by messing with the underlying technology. And tech fixes are frequently ineffective um, for social problems. Take, for example, the link tax. The link tax, as, as described, well, to the extent it's ever been described, is actually impossible. It's technically impossible because nobody will ever deploy it. The only way that it will ever get deployed is if everybody agreed that I really want to be taxed. Well, that seems unlikely. And since it's unlikely that people are going to sign up to be taxed, then they're never going to click on a link that causes them to be taxed. All of the clients will simply not implement the necessary, rec uh, the necessary um, technical requirements to, uh, you know, to cause the, the tax to take effect. And there are only two possibilities at that point. Either, either the, um, the government authority can say, well, you're not allowed to use a backward compatible uh, mechanism, in which case the internet is over, or you are allowed to use a backward compatible uh, um, linking mechanism, in which case only the backward compatible linking mechanism is ever gonna be um, deployed by any client. Those are the only two possibilities, and I've yet to hear anybody explain to me how, um, how we get out of that. On the internet, if you actually want people to deploy things, you have to give them a reason to deploy it. There is no self-interest on the part of the client here to deploy this thing, and so it's not gonna happen. Um, and, and we don't have a network such that the government is, any government is in a position to say, well, perhaps with the exception of one government in the world, but that's really not on the internet. Um, we don't have a, a, a situation in which anybody can say, okay, tomorrow we're going to upgrade all of the computers on the internet in order to have this, this effect. Every time I hear one of those stories, I want to remind people, the last time we forced everybody on the internet to upgrade on the same day was 1983. We had a copy on paper of the names and addresses of every single person who was connected to the internet in those days, and it didn't work anyway. We missed the deadline. That's the reality of deploying things on the internet. So what we have to do is stop imagining that that's the world we're living in and instead accept that what we have to do is create the incentives for people to deploy things that are good for them. That's the reason that the internet works. That's the um, way that we're going to solve any of these kinds of, of social goods that we want. None of this is to suggest that um, uh, you know, copyright is unimportant or that authors getting paid is unimportant, although whether giant um, media combines getting paid is important is maybe a different question that we could ask. Uh, none of this is to suggest that um, you know, the viability of, of journalism and so on is unimportant. Of course, um, similarly, you know, protection of individuals' um, data and so on, all of that is really important. But the way in which proposals to do this are proceeding is as though this is a centralized system that can be directed from above. That's the fundamental mistake, and it's a technical mistake. It's a deep technical mistake. What I have uh, as a question for this dynamic coalition then is how we convince governments that what they're making is a category error. They're proposing legislation that is not actually going to deliver the benefits that they want. It appears, for instance, that the GDPR is almost exclusively beneficial to large, the, 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 basically the very large um, organizations that are the target of it that are the worst abusers of the data, that, that you know, have the most data and are most likely to lose control of it. That seems like a problem, but they're the only ones who can afford to comply. Everybody else is, um, is in a position where they can't and it's going to choke out um, new entrants who might have uh, innovations that, that could help with this problem. Uh, the same thing with these two articles that we've just talked about, right? These, these things are really chilling for people who might come along with proposals for how actually to fix these things in a distributed um, and internet-like way. And I think that that's the critical thing that we need to bring somehow um, governments to understand that the legislation they're proposing and the mechanisms that they're using for this are actually harmful to the end goal that they're trying to achieve. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this, Andrew. And I might add that a couple of days ago on Monday, uh, Susan Vod, I, I hope I say the name right, Vodchiki, 
Uh, CEO of YouTube published a blog post in the uh, YouTube Creator blog, uh, originally appearing as an op-ed in the Financial Times, and the title of that was The Potential Unintended Consequences of Article 13, where she certainly points out the chilling effect to uh, for content creators and the, the difficulty for platforms to then be able to host content. And it does take an example, uh, being the Despacito uh, song, having uh, several, I think she's mentioned hundreds of sources, or, or, or uh, n not just one, or two, or three. We're dealing with very large numbers here. So that then becomes an absolute forest of, uh, of problems. Um, I think we, we can now open the floor for uh, comments and for uh, questions and, and so on. I didn't know whether first I was going to ask Desiree whether she wanted to comment on anything that uh, was mentioned by any of the other panelists. And in fact, I, I can also ask Diego if you've got comments on, on anything else that de that's been said and then uh, start gathering uh, questions and comments. Desiree? Mm, thank you, Olivia. I, I think I'm mostly in agreement with that. Uh, uh, speakers have said, and definitely on the on the um, last one, that uh, maybe some big social platforms would be able to afford both uh, link stacks and the uh, implementation of upload uh, filters that will strengthen them um, even more um, than today. Um, uh, with regards to GDPR, I'm not so sure that I agree on that um, because they um, definitely and the penalty penalties uh, that they are being threatened with could be an incentivized to correct some of their behavior. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, Diego? Yeah, um, but I was going to say the same thing. The GDPR is beneficial to the, the biggest organizations, uh, I agree, but the bigger, uh, biggest organizations is the, 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 the society as, as such, not the big tech companies. Um, if this was beneficial for these big tech companies, they wouldn't have been lobbying so hard for four and a half years in what is, has been described as the biggest lobby storm ever in the European Union. Uh, but I agree with something. I agree that the, there's a trend in the European policy, about, uh, but I also think that it's uh, worldwide. That uh, when we have any problem in our society, we need to solve it uh, with, with tech, with technology. So the, the, the idea behind this is uh, um, the technology is the solution, what is the problem? That's more or less the motto. We have child abuse, we can use the technology to solve it. We have the terrorist content, we have technology to solve it. We have copyright infringements, we have technology to solve it. So I think that's uh, one of the ways that we can really break the way in that our technology works in a, in a way, the way we work as a society. Finally, um, I'm a bit scared that there are one or more, or more sources than Despacito. I think one is too many, but well, okay, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. Okay, so this is a big room. We'll go clockwise uh, in, in the room. I see several hands, and we'll start by uh, Sheva. If I could just ask for all speakers to please introduce themselves when they take the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'm Siva Subramaniam. I'm part of this coalition. Uh, the president of France, uh, Macron, inaugurated uh, the IGF, and it's a great step forward. And uh, France hosted the IGF, but parts of the speech from the French president's, uh, uh, part of the contents from the French president's speech actually threatens to take uh, the internet backward a little, which brings me to the point of uh, the categorical error that Andrew was talking about. And uh, part of this uh, problem of GDPR uh, making a categorical error or a government taking a categorically wrong position arises from the government's not receiving proper inputs and advice. And Andrew, are you, uh, how are you as uh, uh, the president of uh, uh, Internet Society um, uh, looking at uh, this situation and have you done enough to reach out to governments at the highest level uh, to give them uh, inputs and to give them an understanding about how the Internet works? and. Have you, have you done enough? Thank you. Thank you, Sheva. Have you? Let, let's be talk because let's, yeah, let's, let's take a few questions and then let's, uh, let's patch them together. Um, Sebastian Bacholet. <clears throat> Thank you. In the same vein, but, but not, uh, I will not comment of my president uh, speech. Uh, uh, yet uh, somebody in a, a tweet say we seems to be in a, 
uh, undemocratic countries, and I don't want to uh, finish on the, on the jail here, but uh, yet. But um, it's, I, I, I like this debate, but one, one point is how we, we will solve. Okay, we can ask Andrew to go around the world and meet all the kings, the queens, the president, and the prime minister of the world. Thank you, Andrew, for taking this uh, uh, duty uh, as an end user. I appreciate your willingness to do that, but, but frankly, uh, you are not yet God. Then, uh, not yet, Andrew. Uh, and, and I think we need to ask us two questions. How we do something, and the second, it's why this dynamic coalition, as it's supposed to be uh, an, in, within an IGF, we don't have representative from the governments here. Because if we can't find a place, and IGF was supposed to be the place to have this type of discussion, if we have one making a speech on a stage and the other talking here, that means that IGF is not doing the task it was supposed to do. Then we are happy to meet together, and I am happy to, to see you and to, but, but that's not the way we need to do. I am sorry, Olivia, I will, I, I, I know I am a little bit long, but I think it's important to, to know. And do the president have some inputs? Yes, definitely. For example, um, Andrew knew, knew that very well. There is a Isaac French chapter, and they give inputs to people who have uh, some link with, uh, with the current government. Therefore, it's not the question that they don't know. They know, but how we have a discussion with them all together. That's the point, and I think this the Dynamic Coalition must be a place to discuss that. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I know that Andrew has to run off for another session very soon, so I'll give you the floor directly to uh, respond. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, the, the short answer uh, to have we done enough is, well, apparently not, um, because, you know, the wrong answer came out, right? So, um, uh, obviously, if I, just, if I just tried harder, uh, more people would come around to this. I, I'm perhaps a little more jaded than that. I, I'm not totally convinced that all of the people who are participating in this really care if they break the internet. I think that um, part of the difficulty is some of them don't care. And what we have to do is accept that um, we need populations, societies, to rise up and say, hey, wait a minute, um, you're taking away a benefit that I'm get getting. And so what, one of the things we need to do is not talk to individual presidents or kings or queens or um, whoever, but rather to convince the population that what what's being done on their behalf is in fact not delivering the goods. That, that for instance, to show this, the worst, censor, censor, sen, worst thing about censorship is blah, is what's going to happen and people need to understand that um, because that's the, that's the only way that companies are actually going to be able to implement this. I don't believe that political uh, authorities are just going to do this out of maliciousness, but I do believe that they would like it better if they have a world in which they can call up the five people that they, um, who can do a thing for them and, and cause this to, um, you know, and cause the effect that they want. But, but what's happening is the rest of the human population is losing a, an advantage, and we need to make that clear to people, and I don't think we've done a very good job at it. So that's actually the place that I think I would rather spend those, spend those times on airplanes um, actually trying to convince people that the right thing for them is to have the real internet, the internet that we know um, uh, enables them to do what they want. Thank you. And I, I'm, I do apologize, I, I have to leave for another session. Thanks for um, your intervention, Andrew, and thanks for coming in before you have to run off. So uh, we'll continue going around the table. Let's go with the gentleman on, on this side of the table. And did I see a gentleman on the right-hand side having put his flag up, currently looking at his mobile? Perhaps? No, okay. Uh, let's go for this gentleman, please. Hi, I'm Eduardo from Copy Fighters. Um, if you speak with most of the uh, and members of the parliament, of the European parliament, they say that this is a directive that is made against the interests of the big American techs like Google. However, Google said this week or the week before 
that they spend 100 million on the content ID system alone. And the content ID system right now, it doesn't fulfill quite the, um, the requirements. It has to be modified yet. But uh, my question is, how can European uh, startups, for example, uh, example, or any other company or small company in the world, uh, even try to compete with that system? So with a system so expensive, is this uh, regulation or directive really against the interests of, let's say, Google? Thank you. Uh, thanks for this. Diego? Yeah, I don't think that's uh, really a question, but uh, <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, of course, what I think is going to happen is that uh, small companies will end up buying a license from Google that has the best and worst system so far, which is Content ID. And so that's the way they will work in practice because they have the, the biggest database. They have been working on, on it uh, uh, for many uh, years already, and they have invested that amount of money. So I think that's the way it's going to work. But I also I also think that they they really want to to harm this big tech or in a way make it more fair for uh, authors or collective societies or others to be remunerated. But I, I think they're going the right way. We've been telling them for two years and explaining other ways. We're trying to advocate for alternative ways of remuneration, but that hasn't uh, worked out. Uh, what has worked out, uh, and going back uh, to <coughs> what the speaker that I just left said, uh, we need to mobilize people. We need to make people understand why this is a problem and make them active. And I think the groups like yours in Portugal and all there's all around the, 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 the European Union are doing a great job at it. So keep, keep it up. Desiree? I think you pointed out to a really interesting um, fact, and I think it has been known that, uh, for example, um, uh, one of these companies, uh, for example, Google has YouTube and had almost this um, system built already, um, so they'd be easier to comply. But it's also interesting to hear this uh, follow-up story where they might be licensing that, and therefore um, it will definitely play in the favor of um, big players, and it would affect... Uh, small and, and uh, players and startups that wish to provide uh, an upload service. Thank you, Desiree. Any other questions? Let's continue around the table. Clockwise. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in finding out if, and I'll come to you in a second, Roberto, I'm interested in finding out if there's actually anyone in the room that has an opposite view to what's been um, said so far in the room. It's, it's great to talk with each other, but if everyone agrees with each other, then that's it. We can just go home and say, great, we, we know it all. But I'd be really interested in seeing a counter-argument, and please don't be scared. We know nobody's going to come out uh, feet first from here, but it's, it's really interesting to have a good dialogue uh, in this space. I did invite some people from the uh, content industries that are supportive of this, um, but I'm not seeing them around the, the room, so uh, let's, let's get Roberto Gaetano. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if I am agree or disagree. I have a, um, um, I have a point of view that um, um, I basically agree with uh, what Andy was saying when, uh, uh, when he was saying that uh, um, uh, the people who are, some of the people who are moving in uh, in, in this direction are, uh, really don't care uh, about the internet. I was just talking before the um, before the session. I, I expressed this opinion that uh, the internet is uh, in this case a, a pawn in the great game, uh, in the great political game, and. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, that uh, we, as a dynamic coalition uh, on core internet values, we need to uh, protect the internet values, uh, the core internet values, uh, uh, being aware that um, uh, we shouldn't be uh, just uh, um, how can I say just uh, uh, you know uh, that we we have to be able to uh, oppose uh, um, those things. On the other hand. Uh, um, I'm, uh, as uh, a European, uh, I, am, uh, um, I have serious difficulties uh, in uh, taking complete uh, part uh, um, uh, in, in this and, uh, and go uh, against uh, uh, some of uh, um, the uh, legislative uh, um, processes that are, are uh, going on in the European Union. I think that uh, um, 
there is some part of the uh, legislation, uh, GDPR, that is in fact uh, uh, protecting, if not the core internet values, some other core values that I have, which is the privacy and, uh, and human rights on the internet. So I wouldn't um, shoot uh, the GDPR uh, because uh, um, it's, it, it will affect uh, um, uh, the uh, core internet values. And I think that we need to come to a, to a uh, to a solution where uh, we can um, we uh, we can have an agreement that we can defend the uh, core internet values, but also some our core, core values that are uh, in, in rooted in the European uh, uh, culture. Uh, the second thing that I want to do is that uh, I want to say is that in my opinion, the GDPR comes. Uh, because of our inability as internet community, as ICANN community, um, to solve the problem uh, within our uh, multi-stakeholder process. Uh, the, the issues that the GDPR uh, is addressing are issues that were uh, on the floor since the creation of ICANN, and we within ICANN have been unable to solve. So uh, at that point in time, we have given the possibility to uh, some political actors to play around this, uh, around our inability to solve the problem of a balance between privacy and, and other, other rights, and step in um, um, and, and uh, with, a, with a legislation with, which is the wrong uh, which is the wrong way, but I think that we are not innocent on this uh, because it, it, uh, uh, the, the root cause uh, of, uh, of this is also uh, our inability to, to, to solve the problems of, um, over 20 years of existence. Thank you, Roberto. Let's have the lady at the back, please. I think you need to turn your microphone on. Is it? Okay, now, oh, now, it's, now it's on. Okay. Um, my name is Beatriz Busaniche. I'm from Argentina, from Via Libre Foundation. And I strongly agree with our fight against Article 13, Article 11. Uh, but I think we have a problem. I, I will uh, take the chance that we are all together in, a, in the same position <laughs> to, to try to address our problems from our side. I think there's uh, no such thing as the internet values. What are we talking about when we talk about the internet values? Values is that something uh, confusing, exactly as Macron say, uh, saying French values. What are we talking about when we talk about values? It's uh, freedom of speech. It's privacy. It's what are we talking about? It's a technical thing. Uh, I think our problem in, in this narrative is that for people in Europe, we could talk about uh, internet freedom and things like that, but in most of our countries in the developing world, in Africa, in South America, internet for the people is Facebook. They cannot make a difference between internet and Facebook because they just use Facebook and they use zero rating services. So if we go there with our narrative of internet values, they think it's Facebook values or Google values. And I want to uh, propose this debate because in Argentina we are facing a strong lobby from the big media to have something like the link tax. And they said, well, what's wrong with asking Google to pay us? And the, all, the whole debate is uh, between the big media and Google. And that is uh, hard to address from civil society because if you go against the link tax, they said, oh, you work for Google. What's wrong? Google has a lot of money, they, t they, they tell you. And we have to move on from this narrative of the internet values because there are no such thing as internet values. We have to uh, re-engage with the uh, human rights values, and in that, uh, f from that concept, I'd like to say that the GDPR is a model for us. For example, we are debating now a new uh, data protection law, um, and I think there, there is uh, no problem with protecting uh, our rights on our data, to regain control on our data that will not harm internet. 
Uh, but these kind of things will do, and these kind of things will harm human rights, not internet values. So just to thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. And the problem with the one hour uh, session is that we always run out of time. I'm going to let the, uh, um, our panelists to say just a few words, closing words, and then we, I'm afraid, are going to have to vacate the room. Uh, very quickly, um, go to saveyourinternet.eu soon and uh, try to be active, get informed, and, uh, and support the GDPR, uh, but don't support Article 13. Next. Yes, thank you for your comments. I think it's a good suggestion and this coalition should take uh, into consideration, however, the values we're discussing here were the uh, underlying layers of internet architecture that, uh, so maybe that wasn't clear. And I also, I have to say, I agree with uh, Roberto Gaetano said this is an on, uh, in terms of support of GDPR, is, uh, that the um, actual, uh, it was a revenge of lawyers against IT, that's how it's known as a code word of GDPR to try to solve some um, um, issues that are societal issues, but with technical solutions. Uh, thank you for this, Desiree, and uh, thanks, of course, to Andrew uh, Sullivan for having joined us, and to all of you uh, who have spoken and who are attending this session today, and the people that are following us remotely. Just one last thing. We do have a sign-up sheet that did go around the room. I'm not quite sure whether it was made clear that um, what we will do is to uh, send an invite to the uh, email addresses that are there, if, and it's, it's not obligatory as such. Uh, we'll send an invite if you wish to join the Core Internet Values mailing list, and we can then continue the debate and discussion on uh, the mailing list and, and uh, hopefully be able to clarify any points and take this to the next year. So thanks, everyone, and this has been a good session. Bye-bye.